Welcome to the second half of our course. The second half will be dedicated to looking at the kinds of hierarchical cultures found around the world, in contrast to last half's egalitarian cultures. To start, we'll be looking at the Azandi, an African culture whose homeland is not far from the newer we studied in the last unit. The Azandi, however, were traditionally organized into chiefdoms, and much of that traditional structure continues into the modern day. As always, let's start by looking at the location and environment of the Azandi. Zandiland, as it's known, is located in South Sudan and Central Africa. The Nuer live in the northern portion of the country, whereas the Azandi are located in the southwestern portion. Their traditional homeland, in fact, straddles the borders between South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and the Congo. This is a warmer, wetter landscape than farther north. There's ample rainfall and a lot of streams and rivers. Much of the region is well covered by vegetation and forest, but this is not dense rainforest like you'd find farther south in the Congo. Due to the ample moisture and hot temperatures, tropical diseases and pests are common, such as the tsetse fly, which transmits sleeping sickness. It's because of these kinds of pests that the Azandi do not keep livestock like their northern neighbors. Cattle are too susceptible to sickness in Zandi land to be economically viable. Instead, the Azandi have adopted a more purely agricultural strategy. The problems with aridity that limit the Nuer's farming don't apply here, and the Azandi take full advantage of their ability to produce large harvests of a variety of crops. Their most important crops are maize, imported from the Americas of course, and millet, a native African grain. Azandi society is organized similarly to many Central African societies. Kinship is structured according to a patrilineal principle. Children are members of their father's clan, and women do not pass on their own clan membership to their children. This works to form a system of many patrilineal clans, each of which is dispersed widely throughout Zondiland. However, these clans are not especially important in daily life. Most people only know their own genealogies for the past few generations. Relatives, whom we call second or third cousins, are the most distant relatives whose relationships can be traced explicitly. The exception to this is for members of the Avangara clan. All chiefs and subchiefs must come from this clan, and for them, genealogies are carefully maintained. As with most clan-organized communities, Azandi spouses must belong to different clans. The Azandi practice polygyny, a system where each man is allowed to have more than one wife at a time. While this is allowable, many actual households are monogamous. Marriage negotiations usually begin with a potential groom approaching the father of his intended bride. This is frequently done with the consent and encouragement of the bride herself, but the marriage can only occur if her father and his close patrilineal kin agree. The groom then begins payment of a negotiated bride price, much as the newer do. Installments of the bride price may take place over many years and only happen when the man's father-in-law demands them. If he proves to be a good husband, the father-in-law may simply never call for the next payment. The full bride price may never actually be delivered. After a marriage, both husband and wife will move out of their parents' homes and create their own homestead. This pattern of residence, called neolocal, is more common in commercial economies than in agrarian economies like the Azandis. As we'll see in a bit, it developed here in Zandiland because of their unique beliefs concerning witchcraft. The most significant difference between the Azandi and the cultures we've studied previously in this course is that the Azandi are not an egalitarian society, but rather a rank society. Remember that an egalitarian society is one where everyone has an equal opportunity to participate in community decisions and anyone capable of gathering followers can become a leader. This is not the case among the Azandi. For them, leadership is understood to be a unique quality inherent in the male members of the Avangara clan. Furthermore, authority and the right to make decisions varies among the Avangara. Some have more legitimate authority than others, and these differences come down to genealogical relationships to past chiefs. Basically, the right to leadership is inherited. This makes a Zandi society a rank society, one where everyone is assigned a rank within an overall hierarchy thought to measure personal worth and prestige. 
such a ranking system is a hallmark of chiefdom organization. A chiefdom generally has anywhere from a thousand to several tens of thousands of people. There were traditionally several chiefdoms among the Azandi, with rival chiefs fairly constantly at war with one another. To feed multiple thousands of people in a contiguous territory, chiefdoms almost have to be agriculturalists, like the Azandi. There are examples of hunter-gatherer chiefdoms, though, most notably in the Pacific Northwest and in California. Next week we'll read a bit about the hunter-gatherer chiefdoms of the Pacific Northwest. Chiefs are needed in chiefdoms because, now that there are multiple thousands of people in the community, allowing everyone full participation in decision-making is inefficient and untenable. There are just too many opinions and plans to be workable. Instead, the only opinion that really matters is the chiefs. Chiefs are full-time political specialists whose only job is to run the local government and make sure that people can continue to live together in a single society. Among the Azandi, they do not farm their own fields or build their own houses. Those things come from the taxes levied by the chief on his people. His time is thus free to oversee tasks vital to the whole community. This includes managing public works projects like irrigation, contacts with other outside groups, managing the economy of the society, and enforcing traditional laws by holding court. The chief alone, or with the help of a relatively small number of aides, is enough to manage that task. The Zandi strategy of government is typical of many large, complex chiefdoms. Remember that Zandiland was traditionally divided into several competing chiefdoms, but individual chiefdoms were also subdivided into smaller administrative units. A paramount or high chief would live near the center of his territory and hold court there. He'd then subdivide the territory and assign to each district a subchief, usually a close patrilineal relative, and often the son of the previous subchief. These subchiefs may also subdivide their territory and assign local chiefs to the smaller communities. Higher ranking chiefs would set policies for their territory and lower ranking chiefs would be responsible for implementing those policies. Problems of a purely local nature could be resolved locally, while bigger problems would climb the chain of authority until they reached a chief of sufficient authority to decide them. This system of hierarchical governance worked well to resolve internal disputes within Azandi chiefdoms, but it failed when issues arose between chiefdoms. With no higher level of authority to appeal to, Azandi chiefdoms could seldom resolve such disputes and warfare between chiefdoms was common before the mid-20th century. This kind of constant hostility led to the development of another hallmark of chiefdom societies, the existence of definite borders around political entities and uninhabited buffer zones between them. An uninhabited buffer zone meant that one never accidentally strayed into hostile territory, and any foreigners who did so were almost certainly hostile themselves. Not having to ask, do you even know where you are, allowed Azandi warriors to defend their land much more quickly. Probably the most famous aspect of Azandi culture, at least among anthropologists, are their beliefs concerning witchcraft and the use of oracles. This is because of a landmark ethnography written in 1937 by E.E. E. Evans Pritchard called Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Among the Azandi. A classic of anthropological literature, it ranks alongside Malinowski's Argonauts of the Western Pacific for its analysis of the logic of supernatural among non-Western societies. The Azandi believe that witches not only exist, but that they're a pervasive and inescapable part of everyday life. No misfortune or accident can possibly occur without the malevolent action of a witch being involved. Anyone can be a witch, and many people are witches without even knowing that they are. Such beliefs obviously struck early European explorers as wildly irrational, and they concluded very quickly that the Azandi were both superstitious and foolish. It wasn't until Evans Pritchard's research that the larger world could understand the rationale behind Azandi beliefs. First, we should note how one becomes a witch, according to Azandi beliefs. Witches are not sorcerers, who also exist in Azandi culture and who are viewed as actively evil villains. Instead, witches are people who possess mangu, a kind of supernatural substance thought to reside throughout the body. Mangu permits a person to cause supernatural harm to those he or she harbors negative feelings toward. This action can be entirely unconscious and it's generally impossible to tell if someone possesses mangu at all, let alone if it's active. Mangu is activated when a witch has hard feelings toward a relative. 
During sleep, the witch's spirit is said to separate from his or her body, travel to the victim, and eat the spiritual essence of the victim. This causes illness, misfortune, or even death. However, the range over which the witch spirit can travel is limited, and witches can't harm total strangers. This is one justification for the dispersed nature of Azandi homesteads, and the reason that they follow a neo-local pattern of residence. The fewer kin living very close by, the less likely one is to be bewitched. And if something bad does happen, there are fewer potential suspects to be the witch. As I said, all misfortune, no matter how small, is attributed to the actions of a witch. This is despite the fact that the Azandi are clearly logical people who understand the relationship between cause and effect. A man who cuts himself with an axe, for example, clearly understands that the blade harmed him because he dropped it, and that this was just an accident on his part. He'll nevertheless protest that he has been bewitched and wonder who the culprit is. It was that seeming contradiction that led early European explorers to conclude that the Azandi were fundamentally irrational people. Evans Pritchard, however, found that a deeper level of explanation was involved. Yes, that axe was sharp, and yes, the dropping of it and subsequent injury was merely an accident. But why, the Azandi man wonders, did he drop the axe today, when he's used it daily and safely for years? Why did it fall just right to hurt him, and why didn't his brother, working a few feet away, get hurt instead? To Western thinking, the answer to all these questions is simple coincidence. That is, we have no real answer to these questions. The Azandi, however, can formulate an answer, the actions of which, which bring together a series of disconnected possibilities in such a way as to produce a negative outcome. Such an explanation actually fulfills a function. As long as the answer is no answer at all, there's nothing the Azandi can do to control their fortunes or make sense of their luck. But witchcraft is brought on by hard feelings and poor relationships. Once something bad happens, the Azandi man can identify the witch and repair his relationship with him or her. This not only ensures less misfortune in the future, but also serves to encourage good social relationships with the close kin one relies on daily. The problem, of course, is identifying the witch. This is, again, one reason the Azandi prefer to live dispersed in small homesteads. But even in that case, there may be a few dozen people within the few miles radius of one's home that witches can travel. And since Mongu can operate without the witch even knowing it, a witch doesn't have to consciously dislike someone to bewitch them. Worse still, accusations of witchcraft that are later judged to be false can serve as the impetus to hurt feelings that will really activate Mongu. So identifying the culprit with certainty is very important. Thus, before someone makes an accusation of witchcraft, he or she will often resort to another well-known aspect of Azandi belief, an oracle. An oracle is a magical ritual conducted to find the answer to a specific question. Any important decision an Azandi must make will normally be put to an oracle, not just witchcraft accusations. Whether or not to build a new house, or clear new farmland, or invest money in a business venture, any question can be answered in this way. The Azandi typically consult three kinds of oracle. The cheapest and easiest is the termite oracle. The person drives two sticks into a termite mound while asking a simple yes or no question. In the morning, the two sticks are examined. If the one is more eaten by termites, then the answer is yes, and if the other is more eaten, the answer is no. Somewhat more useful is the rubbing oracle. In this oracle, a trained professional must be hired to conduct the ritual. The professional asks a series of simple questions while rubbing special wooden tools together. The way they stick or slide against one another answers the questions. This is more expensive than the termite oracle because the professional must be paid. It's also considered somewhat less reliable because the man may tailor his interpretation to the answer he thinks his customer wants. On the other hand, the rubbing oracle can give answers to several questions all at once, while the termite oracle can only answer one question per day. The most reliable, but the most expensive oracle is the poison oracle. This is considered so reliable that it traditionally formed the basis of the Azandi legal system. The answers given by the oracle were considered legally binding in criminal trials. In the poison oracle, a highly trained professional prepares the poison bengi 
and administers it to a chick. The dosage must be extremely carefully calculated. There must be just enough poison that it's impossible to know exactly how quickly the chick will succumb. Then, as the chick falls victim to the poison, the professional asks a series of questions and interprets its response. The dead chick can then be entered into evidence, so to speak, in official contexts to show that the oracle was conducted properly and its result is reliable. In court cases, when a suspect is shown by the oracle to be innocent, he or she is simply freed. When the oracle declares him guilty, the chief will impose a sentence. Accusations of witchcraft are personal matters that don't involve the chief and his courts, but consulting oracles still serves a purpose in such situations. The consultation takes time, perhaps several days, during which the bewitched victim works his way from one oracle to another seeking clarity. This gives time for hot blood to cool and for calmer heads to prevail. One can't make an accusation immediately after an accident. Oracles only answer yes or no questions, so the victim must go to the oracle with a suspect in mind. Along the way, he will inevitably seek support from the larger community to make his accusation. If the accusation would be too disruptive, the victim can be dissuaded, but if public sentiment is with him, he can feel more secure in his position. In the past, for extreme cases like murder, a witch accused of conscious malevolence might have been killed by the family of the victim. More recently, they're more likely to be called before chiefly courts for punishment. In milder cases, or cases where the witch is not believed to have been consciously aware of his attacks, a simple ritual of apology is thought to be enough to cool the mongu and return it to an inactive state. Of course, that expression of remorse also serves to heal the hurt feelings that caused the attacks in the first place. Much of the traditional Azandi way of life remains intact today. Not much has changed, despite more than half a century of British colonial rule, followed by a half century of independence as part of Sudan. As we discussed when we looked at the newer, the southern half of Sudan became the independent state of South Sudan in 2011, and today that's where the majority of ethnic Azandi live. Prior to independence, the Azandi sided with their southern neighbors in the decades-long Sudanese civil war, but they've been largely neutral in the current civil war in South Sudan. The Azandi are, in many ways, a typical chiefdom-organized culture. They're populous, with correspondingly complex political institutions to regulate and integrate their communities. But more importantly for the history and science of anthropology, their uniquely sophisticated beliefs surrounding witchcraft and oracles help us to understand how radically different cultural perspectives can still be rational and functional. Keep this in mind as you read this week's second assignment, an excerpt from Evans Pritchard's landmark work on the subject.